of the project. So that's a little bit the context in which I was doing the project. Are they here? No, they're not here, but not here. All right. I'll be on standby. All right, well then, let's start. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for being here. It really means a lot to me that you're here. I'm really happy and proud to be able to present the work I've done. I've been working on it since last summer. And I'm just really happy, and I'm happy to see that you're here, and I hope that you'll like the presentation. So where uh, I'm going to, today I'm going to be presenting, launching a website that I made. Let's get up the website. It's about quantum physics. And so today I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about the site and the project and where the idea came from. But also I'd like to do a brief overview of one of the three, one of the three concepts that you'll find on my site and one of my pages that's on my site. So we'll start by going around the site a little bit, having a little bit of a tour of the site, and then we'll get into the science of it. Is that all right with everybody? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Great. All right. Um, now, I'm going to talk, be talking about quantum physics. And a lot of people have asked me, that's really interesting, but why quantum physics? How did you get to quantum physics? Because it isn't a subject that everybody knows about. Well, last, a couple of years ago, I had the great chance to go to Fermilabs, which is a particle accelerator. So for those of you who don't know what a particle accelerator is, it's a center where they do research about particle physics and quantum physics. And it's this really, really big machine, kilometers wide, where they take a particle, and they take another particle, and they're going to speed them up till they're going almost the speed of light, and as fast as they can get them, and they smash them together, and then they see what happens. They're going to study what happens, and sometimes it gives you other particles, and how much energy it's going to give off, and what those particles are going to become. So anyway, so this summer, a few summers ago, I got to visit Fermi Labs, and I fell in love with quantum physics while I was there. That year, I'd done my science fair project on nuclear energy, so I already knew a little bit about the atom, and I just, I really fell in love, and I'd never had time to study it, because it's not something that you have much time to study, and it's not something that there are many resources to study it with. I don't have any degree in physics. I have, this year I'm doing my first physics class ever, and I'm not even finished with it. So it was hard for me to go study quantum physics because there was nothing for beginners that I could find. And that's a little bit where I got the idea of the project, is to make a site, have a resource for people who know just a little bit about physics, who want to learn about quantum physics if they're hearing about it in the news or if they hear about it from somebody they know or just out of general curiosity, that they can start from the very, very basic beginning or wherever they are in their learning and build up from there until they have enough resources, enough knowledge, to be able to go and read on other different sources, other different sites that are out there for people. So that's what I'm going to be doing with you today. So let's start out with the tour of the site. Uh, this is the home page. There's a little introduction for people who wouldn't know me or don't know the project. I'd like to just bring your attention down here to what I call the guest book. And the guest book is basically a tool that I put in my website for people to be able to send me either questions or comments or anything. So you just put your name in the name section and write me a little message, whether it's a question or a suggestion or a comment. And if you'd like an answer to that question, then put your email in. Don't worry, it's private. So nobody's going to see your email except me. And you can just send me that. And I'll be able to see those messages and answer people or bring modifications to the site if need be. Now over here, we have two different sections. There's Physique Quantique Sans Art and Quantum Physics 101, which is right over here. The site is completely bilingual, English and French. So if you're going to be going into the Physique Quantique part, there are going to be three pages right underneath. That's right, in, in English, it's going to be exactly the same concepts, so under Quantum Physics 101. And these are basically the three base concepts of quantum physics. At first, I was doing some reading, and I came across, I thought those were the three, three things that were very, seemed very important from the books I was reading. And I talked to a professor at Laval University who confirmed to me that, yes, these are the three basic concepts that you need to know if you're going to learn more about quantum physics. Uh, there's wave-particle duality, quantum lumps, and uncertainty. Today I'd like to look at wave-particle duality with you, but that'll be a little bit later on. And there's also a page called Quantum Physics 101, which is right here. And this page, oops, there we go. This page is an introduction to physics. It's an introduction to quantum physics with a few scientific concepts, and a few things that I'd like you to remember um, when you're reading the site. So we're going to start with that. But first, I'd like to go see 
we call the news and sources page. The sources aren't on because not everything is complete yet. I was sick last week and I didn't quite have time to complete it. And this is my first con uh, conference that I'll be giving. I'll be giving a few more in class next week. And it'll, the site will be online and completed by this weekend. Um, it's just right now there are some things that are done that don't show up on the site yet. It's being worked on. So if you go see and there's not everything, that's why. But the news part is what I find particularly interesting. It, what I'm doing here is I'm just going to put up little, little paragraphs, little snippets of information about different things that are in the news about quantum physics. Quantum physics is a pretty new science. It's only existed since the beginning of the 19th century. So right now we're having a whole bunch of new discoveries, really interesting things that I would like people to know about. And those are, that's one of the reasons that people might be interested, is if you hear it on the news one night, well, it's CERN, they discovered the Higgs boson. They found the Higgs boson. Well, what does that mean, and why do we care? And these are just different little news. Right now I only have something up about the Higgs boson. They're all bilingual, so the ones written in English in parentheses are going to be the ones that are in English, with different links that you can also go see if you're interested to learn more after the little paragraph that I wrote. So, are we ready to start with Quantum Physics 101? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, this, the first part isn't too complicated, I promise. Now, I've been talking to you about quantum physics since the beginning of the presentation, but really, what is quantum physics? What is it concretely? Because everyone knows maybe a little bit of what it is. Quantum physics, really simply, is the study of everything that's very small. Has anyone here heard about Albert Einstein and the theory of relativity? Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty knowledgeable, yeah. Now, Albert Einstein, in his theory of relativity, explained the interactions between everything that is big. Hi, by the way. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so, Albert Einstein explains interactions between things that are big. Planets, going around the sun, galaxies, even you and me, so gravity, why I'm not floating off to the moon while I'm staying both feet on the Earth, why we're here right now. And what I mean by big, is anything that's bigger than an atom. Now, this is one, the first thing you have to think about quantum physics is you gotta change your mindset. In normal life, atoms, we think of them as really, really, really little, 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 little tiny things. But in quantum physics, they're really, 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 really big things. They're the biggest things we're gonna study in quantum physics. So we just gotta wrap our minds around that and get it. think quantum physics here. So we're just going to be studying um, the interactions between everything that is very small, because relativity works really great for everything that's big. But once you get to the quantum level, under the atoms, of atomic, it kind of falls apart and it doesn't seem to work anymore. So we have quantum physics to explain the very small, and relativity to explain the very big. And someday, what they're trying to do now is they're trying to make a grand unified theory. If anyone's heard about it on the news, if you've heard, read about it somewhere, what they're trying to do basically is take quantum physics, and they take the relativity, and they want to put them together so that they have a new theory that explains the very small and the very very big and doesn't contradict itself. But we'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. So quantum physics is all very well, but why do we care? Because it's great for someone like me who's just interested in it for science and for the purpose of learning. And I think that's motivation enough, just wanting to know how our universe works and knowing what we're made of, how, how it works on the very small level to understand. But for some people, it's not enough for the time, it's not enough for the interest. I mean, yeah, that's very well, but why do I take time in my day that's already very full to learn about quantum physics? There are two different points that I'd like to raise about that. First of all, the news. As I was saying earlier, quantum physics is a new science and we're learning new things every day. So that's one thing, is if you hear it on the news, if you hear about an earthquake, you know how an earthquake works, and if I say that it's an earthquake 2 on the Richter scale, then you know pretty much what that means. If you're looking at quantum physics, I'd like for people to be able to think the same thing. Yeah, I know pretty much what that means. I know why I care that we've dis discovered the Higgs boson. This isn't just one of those things that goes Bow. So this is one of the reasons that I think it's important to take time to understand, at least have a base understanding of quantum physics. The other, and this might seem a little funny, is self-confidence. Now, a few years ago, everyone's saying, ah, rocket science, that's way too complicated. That's for really, really smart people, and I'm never going to understand rocket science. But today, most people do have a basic understanding, a basic knowledge, and you can wrap your head about what rocket science is, or computers. 
Everyone used to think that computers were this really crazy thing for really smart people, but now everyone can use them. Quantum physics is like that. It's new, so everyone thinks that nobody can understand it, but I'm convinced that anyone can have at least a first level understanding of quantum physics. So I think that it's important for you to say, yes, that's not beyond me. I'm not too dumb to understand this. I'm smart and I can do this. <laughs> and it was one of the things for me when I was starting, I was thinking, oh, that's complicated. And then I'd read a page and I'd say, oh, that wasn't so bad. I think I get, I think I get this. <laughs> so I think it's a very important thing for us not to give up and think that's too complicated, but to really go for it and try to understand it. And if we try, I think that we're able to do it. Now I'm going to skip a part. And I'm going to go down to the end of the page. To, I think this is the most important thing you're going to have to understand tonight. And it's keep your mind open. Now this might seem a little crazy. Because, you know, you're learning about science and you think, sometimes we think we know about science. But the first thing you have to remember in quantum physics is that you can understand it. Because if you start out thinking, I can't do this, I can't get it, this is beyond me, I promise you're not going to understand a word I say tonight past this one. But if you start with the mindset of, I can do this and I can understand, then you're going to be able to understand. So that's the first thing. After that, I'd like you to right now, Forget everything you think you know about science. Because there are a lot of things, some things do transfer into the quantum world, but there are a lot of things that just don't. It doesn't work. Quantum physics is weird. There's no better word to describe it. It is weird. And it's counterintuitive. And it's very different from anything any teacher's ever taught. Me. So just forget what you think you know and be ready to accept what I'm going to tell you and what you're going to do. Now another thing is, quantum physics I was saying is weird. And if you can't completely grasp it, you, you understand what I'm saying and you're ready to accept it, but somehow in your head you can't get that mental picture of it. You're not alone. Richard Feynman, which was a, who was a very, very eminent scientist, he was a great teacher at California Institute of Technology and at um, Cornell University, he said a um, very famous quote that I like a lot, he said, you see, my physics students don't understand it. That's because I don't understand it. Nobody does. <laughs> so if you can't quite grasp it, trust me, you're not alone. You just have to let it stew in your brain for a while and try to just accept it as it is. Have faith. Have faith, exactly. <laughs> Last thing is, please have fun. I know this is complicated stuff. It's not easy. But I think you're able to understand it, and you're not here to take a class. I promise, no quiz at the end, no quiz at the end of the conference. Just have fun with it and discover something new, and just take this occasion to broaden what you know and your knowledge about science. All right, so let's go into the real science of it now. First, I want to start with just a little introduction into the big, the space we are, because as I was saying, atoms are now really big. So an atom. Is everybody here familiar with the concept of an atom? Yes. Just want to make sure if I... Alright. So I'm just going to skip over to what we call a subatomic particle. And a subatomic particle is something that makes up an atom. So an electron, which is in an atom, is a subatomic particle. Quarks, which make up protons and neutrons, they're also subatomic particles because they're smaller than an atom. And quantum physics deals with subatomic particles. Okay, by the way, I just forgot to tell you, if you have any questions at all, just raise your hand and ask me right now, because I wouldn't want anyone to not understand one thing, and then you don't understand anything, because there was that one point right there that I said a word, and that didn't make sense. So feel free to ask any question you want, whenever, and you have it here. Now, these are a lot of words in the vocabulary section that are either interesting for general knowledge or necessary to understand something that's on the site. I'm going to skip over a few because obviously we're only going to see one concept tonight. And there's only a few words that you're going to need to know. So instead of cramming your heads with a bunch of words that aren't going to be useful, I'm just going to go to the essential. Volume. Now volume is an important concept for what we're going to be looking at today. It's basically the space something takes up. So if you look at my arm, my arm has a certain volume. It occupies a certain part of space. And the volume is everything that's contained within all the points on the surface of my arm. So it has a length, that's what we call the x-axis, horizontal, so it has a length. 
it has a height, which is the y-axis. We're going to come back to those in just a minute. It has a height. Now, depending on where we are in my arm, that's a different height, but that doesn't matter. It's still a height. And it has a depth, because I'm not two-dimensional, I'm three-dimensional. So I'm going to have a depth, and that's what we call the z-axis. And we come back to that later. So the volume is in the three dimensions, at least in our world it is. And it's going to be every everything that's contained within the points on the surface of my arm. Are we good with that? Good. Mass. Mass is different from weight. That's the first thing you got to know. The main difference between mass and weight is that mass is always constant, whereas weight changes depending on gravity. So my mass is how much stuff I made of. How many subatomic particles? How many atoms are inside me and make up my physical being? Whereas my weight is how much gravity is going to pull on that mass, on that matter that makes me up. So my weight can change. Now I'm not talking dieting or losing weight here. <laughs> my weight can change. If I go to the moon, I'm going to lose weight, but I'm not going to lose any mass. But So see, that's the difference between mass and weight. So when we're looking at mass, we really mean how much is in, how much matter is in a certain object. So it can be a subatomic particle, or it could be you and me. Um, here, I think there was one more thing. No, I think that's all we're going to go for that. One last concept is what we call a coordinate grid, and that's what I was talking about before with different axes. axes. So a coordinate grid is this imaginary set of crisscross lines that we draw in space to be able to visualize something. So I could put a coordinate grid on this screen. I would have an x-axis that would be going that way. I would have a y-axis that's going to be going that way. If I wanted to make it three-dimensional, I would have a z-axis that's going to go straight out towards you. But for now, we're just going to think about two dimensions because it's easier to draw, it's easier to visualize, and that's just one less component that we have to think about for now. So you have our horizontal x. And our y, and then eventually you'd have crisscrossing lines in the middle. Those are all, all the lines are separated by an equal space. So you can't have a line there and another line there, they're all equal. And they're separated by, and we put numbers to them. So you could have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or you could have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, you could have 3, 6, 9. That doesn't matter as long as the difference between the numeric values of each line is equal, is the same. All right. So are we good with mass, volume, and a coordinate grid? Mm -hmm. All right. Wave-particle duality is the concept I'd like to look at with you today. Wave-particle duality is one of the basic concepts of quantum physics because it explains how particles act, how different particles act, and why they do it. But before we go into the theory of it, I'd like to see waves and particles because wave-particle duality there are the two concepts in there that I want to make sure everyone understands before we go into the wave-particle duality. So let's start out with particles. Particles are little objects in space. They're little, little things that make up matter, make up what we are, they make up our entire universe. And we usually think of them as particles. Now, this seems really, really self-evident. <laughs> it's almost funny. But you're going to see as we go on, this is going to change. It's not going to be as obvious. But we usually think of the particle as kind of a little, little mini, mini marble, if you want, like, or maybe a little small planet, because often we say that electrons orbit around the nucleus in an atom, orbit around. So that's kind of the image of a planet orbiting the sun. But in reality, particles don't look like that. They're not little mini spheres. We don't really know what they look like because we can't see them. There's no microscope powerful enough to see a particle. But physicists know that's not what they look like. But for now, I'd like you to keep that image of that little shrunken down marble in your head, because it makes it easier for people to visualize. And that's what a lot of scientists use as an image. So we're just going to keep that idea that particles are like little tiny little marbles. Now, obviously, uh, a teacher at Stanford University says that all analogies are faulty, but some are better than others. And I find that's a very good quote because it, it's true. We have an analogy between our particle and our little small marble. If, even if you take a marble and you shrink it down as much as you can, you can never get to a particle. Because particles are points in space. If we put them in a coordinate grid, 
we have right here. A marble is going to have different coordinates all around its surface. That would be at 1 and 2. That would be at 0 on the x-axis and 1. It has all different coordinates all around its surface. If you take a particle, a particle has only one coordinate. The entire particle, the whole thing, is on one point. That's really hard to visualize for us because we live in a world where everything has volume. Even the smallest dot on a piece of paper, it has volume. Now, if you take our marble down, we shrink it down as small as we can. It's not going to be a particle. Because all its coordinates around its surface, no matter how close we get them all together, we squish them down to the very smallest, there's still going to be a lot of them. There's still going to be all of them are going to be different. And that's why it's not like a particle. A particle has only one. Is that good with everybody? All right. Now, some of you may be wondering. I, your questions from the audience. If they all have the same volume, which is to say no volume, how do they have mass, right? All right, good. That sounds good to me. All right. Now, it, it's a legitimate question because it does seem strange to us in our minds how two things which have no volume could even have mass, let alone different ones have different masses. Now, I'm going to give you another image to try and visualize that in your head. Say we take a marble that's made of wood. We take another marble which, make, which is made of gold. Now it makes a pretty expensive marble, but this is hypothetical, so it doesn't matter. And we take those marbles and we shrink them down. We shrink them up really small. And now I know I said that we could never make a marble a particle, but we're just going to pretend for a moment that some magic happens and whoop, they turn into particles. Now remember, mass is how much matter makes up any object. So while, shrink, while I'm shrinking my marbles down, I'm not taking any matter out. In my wood marble, I have less matter to begin with than in my gold marble. So when I shrink them down, I'm not taking any matter out. And when they become particles, I still haven't taken any matter out. So one of them, the gold marble, still has more matter in it, still has a bigger mass, than my other one, my wooden one. And that is how different particles can have different masses. So great, now we know that particles exist and what they are, but how do scientists know that these particles are actually particles? Because we can't see them, we can't feel them, we can't smell them, we can't touch them. So how do we know that they're there? For that, we're going to turn to Einstein. Now I know I said earlier he worked more with relativity, with big things, but he also had many great contributions to the world of quantum physics. And one of them was proving that particles sometimes act like particles. And it's this little contraption that he made called the photoelectric plate. Photoelectric plates today are used for capturing solar energy. So this is an invention that's kept going. And basically what it is is you have a piece of metal, and there's going to be energy, light, that's going to be hitting that metal plate. Now without going into the whole science of how it works, the light, the light is going to excite all the little electrons in the metal, and that's going to create an electrical current. So that's how we're going to get the light into the electrical current. That's all really good, but we still haven't proven that our particles are really particles. Because when you look at light around us, do we look like there's little balls, little marbles falling everywhere around us? It doesn't. But there are still photons. We know there are photons that make up light. And the, way, the reason we know that is in the photoelectric electric plate, I'm sorry, it's going to be absorbing energy, not continuously, like if I was pouring water on it, but in little chunks, in little clumps. So it's going to go, oh, that's some energy, and oh, that's more energy, and oh, that's more energy. So we know that it's coming as if it was raining, little drops of water, instead of just pouring the water on it. And that's how we know that sometimes particles act like little particles, like little points. Let's move on to waves. Waves are a big part of our lives, even if we don't always know it. Um, light is a wave. Now, some of you might be saying, wait, didn't you just say that light was a particle? I did. And now I'm saying that light's a wave. And I know I'm contradicting myself, but we're going to get back to that. So just hold that thought for now. Have faith. Have faith. There you go. <laughs> so now we have our photons that are light. Sound waves are waves, obviously. So the reason you're hearing me is that there's a wave that's going through the air and it's going to come into your ears. If you drop a rock into water, 
that's going to be waves too because they're, as you see, the waves go up and down. So if you're going to the ocean and you see the big waves, those are the same, basically the same concept as waves that make up light or sound. This is an image of what we call a transverse wave. And there are different parts to waves. So right up here, the highest part of the wave is called a crust. And the lowest part of the wave is called a trough. And between two consecutive crests or troughs, there's what we call a wave. And that's going to be, influences a lot of things in physics. So maybe the color of the light you see is influenced by the wave. If it's smaller, it's going to be one color. And if it's bigger, it's going to be another color. Now waves, when they meet, if you take two particles, two, say two balls, and you slam them together, what's going to happen? I'm going to take my two particles, they're going to bang into each other, and they're going to just go somewhere else. They're going to go somewhere else. And they're just going to change their course. Nothing else is going to happen. But when two waves meet, it's a different story. It creates what we call an interference pattern. So if you have a trough and a crest that are going to meet, so you got your wave going like this, and you have your wave going like this. And going our waves like this, and I have a trough that's right here, and I have a crest, and they're meeting. Now if that trough and that crest are exactly equal in amplitude, they're going to cancel out, and there isn't going to be a wave anymore. Like if you drop two rocks into a pot of water, you're going to see sometimes the waves are going to crash into each other and they're just going to stop, and they're going to calm. The water's going to be calmer. If you take two crests and they're going to meet, so we're coming into a crest right here, and they bump into each other, they're going to go up and they're going to make a bigger crest. And if you take two troughs that are coming together, so here we've got our two troughs going into a trough, they're going to hit each other, and they're going to go even lower. So we're going to have a wave that's going to have more amplitude to it. It's going to be important in our next point, because now we've proved that particles can act like particles, without sense of electric plates. Now, how do we know that sometimes particles, or what we think are particles, act like waves? The English scientist Thomas Young has the answer to that. What he did is he made what we call a double slit experiment. So what he did is he's basically, he has this beam of photons that he's going to be shooting out. And in front of that beam of photons, there's a wall. But in the wall, at two different places, there are going to be holes. Can everybody visualize that setup, OK? All right. Now behind the wall, there's a big screen. And that can detect where there's light, where the light gets through. So sometimes it's going to light up a little bit if there's light, and it's going to stay dark if there's no light hitting it, if there are no photons hitting it. So if you shoot photons, and they're going to act like particles, you would expect to see a point and a point and a point where the holes are. But where there's a wall, you'd expect to see complete darkness, because there's no reason why that photon would go through the wall. But if you shoot it through, and it's going to act like a wave, and this is what Mr. Young found, is that you have an what we call an interference pattern. So sometimes there was more light. That's where either two troughs came together, or two crests came together to make a bigger crest or a lower trough. And that had light. And then next to it, it was dark. And that's where they came together to cancel out. And then there's more light. But that light in the middle is behind the wall. So how do the photons get there? And then next to that, there's darkness again. And then there's light again. That's what we call the interference pattern. And that's when they figured out that sometimes light acts like a wave. Later that experiment was tried out with electrons, and then later it was tried out with a bunch of other different particles to prove that wave particle duality and particles acting like waves is a generalized phenomenon throughout the different particles in the quantum world. But he did it originally with photons. Now, we have particles that act like particles, and we have particles that act like waves. And we have proof that both work, that both happen. So which ones are they really? Which is what you might be thinking right now. Because I've been contradicting myself, but I've been saying that light's a particle and light's a wave. And that it can't be both at once, can it? That's where wave-particle duality comes in. Wave-particle duality says that sometimes different particles act like particles. And sometimes the particles act like waves. Now, so I don't lose anybody. Now I'm going to be using particle, the word particle, in two different meanings. When I just say particle, 
I'm talking about the physical entity of a particle, that particle which can be like a particle or like a wave. But if I say acts like a particle or has the characteristics of a particle, that is the Einstein photoelectric plate particles. That's the ones that if you were to shoot just one through, or if you're going to, that's what we expect to see, just different dots on the photoelectric plates that didn't, uh, on the, sorry, I'm sorry, on the, during the double slit experiment. So that's what we're expecting. That's what I'm talking about with that part. Is that everybody clear on that? Is that going to mix everybody up, or are you fine with that? Mm -hmm. All right, good. So there are many different reasons, many different ways that we try to interpret that duality, that kind of contradiction in what particles are. I'm going to present two of them to you tonight. One which is a generally accept, accepted interpretation, a rationalization if you like, and another which is very widespread also. Some scientists don't like it because it has this one component to it that is a little strange, but you'll see that when we get there. But these are the two leading theories in why particles act like particles and why particles sometimes also act like waves. The first one, which is the most widespread, is the Copenhagen interpretation. And that's an attempt by some of the most eminent scientists, uh, physicists, I'm sorry, of the 1920s, to explain the results they were getting in their experiments. Because at first they didn't know that sometimes particles went one way and sometimes particles went the other. They just kind of went, whoa, this isn't working. So they're trying to rationalize it. See, that's, that was kind of the story of quantum physics. They, made an they did an experiment expecting this outcome, and then instead of being that, it was that, and they went, ooh, that's weird. So then they had to find a way to explain it. So they're trying to explain it, and they're going to base their theory on something we call Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I'm not going to get into that right now, because that's another a whole different page on the site, and you don't need to understand it for now. But what you have to understand, just the basic idea, is that the particle that we're talking about, it's not at one place for sure. Like, I, you guys can all see that I'm standing right here. You have no doubt in your mind that I might be out there because I'm right here. But if I was a particle, you wouldn't know where I am. I could be over there, and I could be over there, and I could be over here, and that's a probability. So uh, maybe I have a 75% chance of standing right here, but I might have 5% chance of being out there outside, freezing because it's really cold outside. So that's an idea of a particle. Okay, So that's what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says. It says we're uncertain. We don't know where the particle is. If, unless we measure, we're only going to measure right now, that's where it is. But until we really measure it, we don't know. And what they've said is, well, maybe, just maybe, this particle that sometimes acts like a wave, actually acts like a wave because its probability of being different places is maybe one right here, and it's maybe a 2% probability of being over here, and a 1% right there, and then whoop, all the different places it could be started to look like a wave. So they're saying that the particle, because we don't know where it is, it's in all those different places at once. Now that's a weird concept to wrap your mind around, okay? Because I can't be two places at once. Sometimes I'd like to be, and I'm sure some of you feel like that sometimes, but we can't. And that's because we're big and there's different factors that influence that, but I can't be at two places at once. But a particle can. It can be in a bunch of different places all at once along that wave. Now, I'm going to use an analogy to give you an idea of why that would create the interference pattern. So let's say that I'm a particle, okay? So I can be at many different places at once. There aren't two of me, there are five of me, there's just one of me, but I'm at different places at once. And it's kind of funny to think about. <laughs> But we just have to accept that concept for I can be at many different places at once. So I get up on a Monday morning and I go run, I go for a run. But I also stay in my bed and sleep. I'm sure a lot of us wish we could do that. That sounds like a pretty good plan to me anyway. I'm liking this. Yeah, I like that too. So me goes running and I see, oh, there's an accident. Nothing big enough that I could have heard about it on the radio. That's really important. So there's no other way I could have known about the accident. But it's big enough that if I take that road to work, which is my usual, usual road to work, I'm going to be late. Or if I'm going to school, I'm going to be late. So when I come back from my run, I get home. And in the mean, meanwhile, I have gotten up and had breakfast and gotten dressed. 
And I tell myself, hey, Louise, there's an accident in this street. You better take that street to go to school, otherwise you're going to be late. Now, a particle doesn't actually communicate with itself. Remember? All analogies are faulty. <laughs> but, say, just imagine that I tell myself that. So, I decide to take another route to school or another route to work. Therefore, I get to work on time. Now, I have changed the outcome of the experiment by being at two different places at once. That's just like the particles that are acting like waves because they're all along in the probability. They're going along, all their waves, and they're all at different places at once, and then they interfere with each other. So the crests come together, or they cancel out, and whatever happens, that all mushes together, and that's why it creates an interference pattern. So I, being at many different places at once, just like the particle, whether it's a photon or an electron, had altered the outcome of the experiment by being at different places at once, different probabilities of being at different places at once. And that is what all these physicists came up with to rationalize why sometimes these photons were acting like particles and sometimes they were acting like waves. Don't you love physicists? <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, this is quantum physics for you. Now the other idea is what we call the superposition of states. And what that says, it's relatively simple, and you'll understand the relatively a little later. <laughs> They're saying that until we measure a particle, and I'll get back to what a me measuring is, it's both a particle, it's going along as a particle, doo -doo, and it's also, at the same time, there's not two of them, there's just one, but at the same time, it's a wave. So it's going along, and that one's going straight, and that one's going wavy, and it's all fine until we measure it. Measuring means taking any measurement, either with an instrument, if we could see particles, it could be looking at it, it could be doing the double slit experiment, it could be using photoelectric plates, anything that forces the particle to choose whether this time it's going to act like a particle, or this time it's going to act like a wave. Now, this, this is weird, I tell you. So it's going along, I'm a, I'm a particle, and I'm going along, and I'm a wave, and I'm a particle at the same time. And I run into the double slit experiment. And I have to choose at that one moment whether I'm going to be a wave right now or I'm going to be a particle. Now, some physicists don't like that idea because they say, how does the particle choose? <laughs> Particles are not conscious that we know of, at least. So how does it choose? Now, that's the downfall of that theory. Some physicists like it, some don't. That's your choice, whether you prefer the Copenhagen interpretation of the superposition of states. Both theories do have their merits. But uh, that's what a lot of physicists don't like about the superposition of states. Now, do you think the superposition of states is kind of weird? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. And you know what? We're not the only ones. Mr. Erwin Schrodinger, who was one of the eminent physicists who really tried, started the basis of quantum physics, he didn't like it either. So to come out against quantum physics in a way, he made up kind of a hypothetical experiment that we could do that would prove that superposition of states is impossible. Unfortunately for him, and kind of fortunately for us, the scientific community went, yeah, that's exactly it, you got it, instead of going, yeah, that's crazy, you're right. So he was kind of discouraged, but now that hypothetical experiment has become one of the most iconic examples of superposition of states, and even of quantum physics, that I'm sure some of you have heard about. It's called Schrodinger's cat. Anyone recognize that? So basically, what you're doing with Schrodinger's cat is you take a cat, any cat, it doesn't really matter, and you put it in a box. Now, remember, this is hypothetical, so we're not going to be killing any cats for real. <laughs> hypothetical never happened. For any cat lovers in the audience, don't, don't worry about the cat. So you put the cat in the box, and with the cat, you're going to put a radioactive source. It's going to be giving off radioactive radiation. That was a little bit it, sorry. It's going to be giving off radiation. And there's a captor that's going to be measuring how much radiation has been given off by the source. Now, that captor is actually attached to a rock, which when the plate here, say it's a sensor, when it gets to a certain amount of radiation, it's going to drop the rock, and the rock's going to fall on a vial of poison. And now we're going to just suspend your dis disbelief for a minute. As soon as the vial breaks, the cat dies. Automatic. And if the rock falls, the vial breaks automatically. There's no the rock might or might not break the vial, or the cat may or may not die from the poison. The cat dies, and the rock breaks the vial. 
automatically. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, radioactivity is a random process. We can measure the probabilities, where probability comes up a few, fair few times here, the probability of whether or not it's going to give off a radiation or not. But we can't know for sure that every five seconds it's going to give off this amount of radiation. So we close the box and we put it in the closed room so that we have no idea whether that cat is alive or dead. We can't hear it, we can't see it, we can't feel any vibrations. The cat really is isolated. Now, some people say that it doesn't work because the cat could be conscious enough, enough to know whether it's dead or alive. They could measure, concept of measuring, but we're just going to say for now that the cat doesn't know whether it's alive or dead. It just is. So you put that whole box in a room, and you wait until the time when the probability of the rock having fallen is exactly 50%. And at that moment, until you open the box, you don't know whether that cat is dead or whether it's alive. And there's not more chance that it's alive, it doesn't have more chance of being dead, it's really 50-50. That's like the particle. Particles away, and the particles a particle. The cat is dead, and this is what Schrodinger was looking at. The cat is also dead, and that's what he was saying. Well, the cat can't be dead and alive at the same time, and the vial can't be broken and unbroken at the same time. But that is the basic idea of superposition of states. It's saying that until you open that box or measure it in any way, that cat it's dead and it's alive. And when you open the box, you either go, phew, the cat's dead, or darn, we have to put it in the garden. But until then, you really, it's both. It's both at the same time, and you don't know. That is the idea of superposition of states. Now, we have two theories, but again, they're both saying it's kind of one and the other, or one or the other, or neither one nor the other. What is it really? Really concretely, tell me, well, what, what is it? The answer is, we don't know. It depends on what you'd rather believe, and it depends on the experiment you're doing. But what you have to know is that sometimes particles act like particles, they act like little marbles, and sometimes particles act like waves. There, that wasn't too hard, was it? <laughs> Good. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Well, then there's just... Um, one concept that I'd like to look at with you before we go to have refreshments, and that is the Higgs boson. Now, who, who heard on the news or in any context about the Higgs boson? Raise your hand. All right, so that's, that's a lot of you. A lot of people have heard about the Higgs boson. And the reason that the Higgs boson is such a big deal is that, you remember we were talking about mass earlier? Well, we know that different particles have different masses. I don't know why. So the Higgs boson was a particle that was predicted by Peter Higgs, who was a physicist. And he said, looking at all the different tables of different particles that existed, he says, I think there should be this thing, a boson right here, Higgs boson, that would give mass to all the different particles. It would have a field. So something that, kind of like an electromagnetic field that's around a magnet, but it would be universe-wide, and it would give different particles mass. And how does that work? Well, here's another, another analogy, getting a little faulty, but give you a good idea. Let's say that I'm walking, I want to get from this end of the room to the door. And I'm walking with American President Barack Obama. And the room is full of reporters. And the reporters are the Higgs field, basically. This is, by the way, this is an analogy that I got off a video that's linked here. Um, so we enter the room together, and we're both walking towards that door. Now, there aren't many reporters that are going to come see me, because they don't really care about me. They're all going to go see President Obama. So he's going to have all the Higgs field conglomerate around him. So he's going to become a very massive particle. And I'm not going to have hardly any mass at all. Because none of the reporters are going to come see me, so I'm just going to zip through that door, and I'm just not going to interact very much with that Higgs field. Whereas President Obama would be a massive particle and would interact a lot with the Higgs field. And 
That's one of the reasons that the Higgs boson was such a big deal. Because it gives mass, and if we don't know why particles have mass, then that makes it kind of complicated, because they do. So why do they? And that leaves the question open-ended. The other reason the Higgs boson was such a big deal is that we, call, we have what we call the standard model in quantum physics. We have a little table. Has anyone heard about the periodic table of elements? It's a table where you have all the different elements in horizontal and vertical lines. And that means a bunch of stuff that we don't need to think about right now. And we have the same thing in quantum physics. So we have all the different particles, what we call the particle zoo, which is just a term to say all the different little particles that we've discovered. And we don't really know what they do, some of them. But we know they're there, and they exist, and they can exist. So we put, put them all in a little graph like that. And there was a hole in that was the Higgs boson that I was talking about earlier. And the thing is, if they, found, if they find the Higgs boson, that just gives weight to the standard model. It says, all right, good. That seems to be working out. The problem is, if you don't find the Higgs boson, or you can prove that the Higgs boson doesn't exist, then you got all those physicists who were grow earlier when they found it, they're going, yay! Now they're going, shoot, now I have to go back to the drawing board. Everything we think we know doesn't work anymore. So now we have to throw all that in the garbage and start over, which some of them might be going, yay, job security. But the rest of them are going, dark. So that is the reason why the Higgs boson was such a big deal, because not finding it could tell us that everything we think we know about quantum physics isn't true. And that's kind of a big deal in quantum physics. So on this, I'd like to um, send you out to SNAP, but uh, to the, sorry for questions. And But before I let you go, I just have a few people I'd like to thank. First of all, I'd like to thank the St. Elia de Bacacci Municipality and the Community Center for letting me use the room. Uh, Ms. Joan Sheehan, who's here tonight, uh, Ms. Carolyn McCarthy, and Ms. Pamela Barish, who helped with the organizing of the event and having the room. Thanks a lot for letting me use the room. It means a lot. And thanks for being here also. Yeah. Great honor for me to have you here. Also, uh, Professor Laurent Rissen from Laval University, who lent me books and helped me out a lot with the project, and I really appreciated his help in the project. Uh, also, Moses Akhama Secondary School for lending me the projector and different cords and different material that I needed for tonight in the camera. Um, it's really appreciated. Also, my project supervisor, Mr. Pierre-Luc Coutier, and obviously, being my supervisor, he helped a lot with the organization and different glitches that worked in my head and didn't really work out when I talked to someone else about it. So thanks to him for being here, too. Uh, he said I couldn't be here tonight, but thanks for the help. And Mr. Benoit Prévost, who also helped me before I knew who my supervisor was, he helped me out with the whole personal project aspect of it and gave me different tips on how to start off and different things like that. And also to you, my audience, thanks for coming. It really means a lot to me that you were here tonight, and it makes me so happy to see you all here tonight. So if you have any um, comments, I'd love to hear what you th thought about the presentation. If you want to write it down at the back, there's a couple pages. And just if you want to read at the refreshment table, I put a couple little um, science-y notes. And I have a different, this is the link to the website. As I said, it's not quite finished right now, but it'll be done by the weekend. So whenever you hear about something, or if you're interested, you can go out. I'm just going to pass these up. Thanks for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. So we think that's it. But then again, physicists aren't sure. They're never really sure. So it could be, but it does have, it is linked to how much matter is inside the particle. But at that scale, they're so small then it's hard to say, well, that guy has more matter than that guy, because they are so small. But we do think it has a lot to do with the interaction with the heat scale. Any other questions? Thank you, because that was the whole point of the project. I'm so glad you did. Yeah, that's very interesting. We were talking about the way you did it. Yeah, that's very interesting.